Each week, you have a chance to win a t-shirt from Pro Wrestling Tees during Review or Raw. All you have to do is pay attention for the secret question and then submit your answer at Law Radio on Twitter and you'll be entered into a draw to win your t-shirt, including our own brand of shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com slash law. Welcome to Reviewer Raw. I'm John Pollock, along with Wei Ting. Yeah, sporting his raw hat <laughs> for oh, Monday raw. night. Yeah. I uh, clearly did not get the memo no. about what show we were reviewing. Yeah. Wow. Well, I that, better leave. Then, that's so. for Wednesday, actually. It is, Which yeah. you can now see on our YouTube channel every Wednesday. Review a SmackDown. Hence, I wore this shirt so we could promote the fact that you can now watch Review a SmackDown right. every Wednesday at... YouTube.com slash Live Audio Wrestling, where you're probably watching this right now. So go to YouTube, unsubscribe from all those other channels you've got, and just subscribe to ours. Don't do that. No, don't get perspective. You need a cross-section of all opinions, and we only provide one of those. Ooh. So, well, yeah, whatever some... whatever you want. So you're, you're, you're not going to change for the next two days, I take it? I can't. Yeah. Cool. I wish I was like that house of horrors that could go from blue to red. You just need Bray Wyatt to go, wow. Yeah, that's it. Change blue to red. Yeah, maybe. Knowing uh, knowing some of our setup here, the lights could go out at any moment. True. I'm amazed that hasn't happened in two mm. years of doing this that the lights have not gone out. Cameras have gone out. Cameras, yes. Yeah. So in a way, the viewer at home, their lights have gone out, even though we wouldn't even realize it. Mm. Well, Sam would have our back, right? Yeah. Unless yeah. he falls asleep. So that's our job. Keep him awake at this late hour. Mm-hmm. Well, let's go into Raw from s- Monday night. In Sacramento, California, at the Golden One Center. The Golden One Center? Golden Center, not enough. Okay. Golden One Center. Okay. I wonder if there's a numerical set of Golden Centers in Sacramento. Do you think there's a Golden Two and a Three and a Four? I don't think there is. I don't know if there are that many arenas in Sacramento. No, no. They uh, used to be the Arco Arena. Is that what that used to be? Because I've been to the Arco Arena. You've been to? Oh, for, um, for UFC. For UFC. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Home of the... I, I learned so much about, like, uh, American companies from, like, you know, uh, wherever Raw is taking place. Because we don't... Golden One, I don't even know what that is. We don't have that up, up here in Canada. When I was younger, I did really well in geography. Yeah. Because I followed, just through wrestling, I knew where all the cities, what states they were in. I knew yeah. all surrounding cities. Like, you just... You would hear something like... Macon. Instantly, you knew it was in Georgia. Totally. And I totally got that as a result of following wrestling. I think a lot of wrestling fans have that ability. I mean, I I know a weird amount of Ontario geography from those, like, uh, WWE kind of, like, live event updates. Yeah, they're just going through their Ontario Sarnia, Ontario. Like, how else would I know about Sarnia, Ontario if not for That's how you spell Sault Ste. Marie. Yes, exactly. It's a real confusing one, so... Pro wrestling. Great for geography. Great for geography. So we started off with the women's division inside of the ring, which was all decorated with an empty podium. And they said it was for a very special event. And out comes Alexa Bliss with her newly won Raw Women's title. And she's the only one who gets an introduction. We have Bailey, Mickey James, Dana Brooke, Alicia Fox, Nia Jax, and Emma all in the ring. A lot of the focus put on Bailey, uh, who's looking very disappointed. She was told, act like an upset nine-year-old child mm-hmm. and sulk. Mm-hmm. It was very noticeable and very forced. How else are you supposed to show that? Have Listen, you ever? Look, I've well, never I... seen you pouting. I've never in my <laughs> life seen you just off into the corner pouting. She had her what? arms folded. <laughs> it was... Pro wrestling is not really known for, for subtlety, you know? And uh, I don't know if it would have worked if you asked for, for a Bailey to act subtly disappointed. Well, Bliss says that Kurt Angle made all the women come out here, which was at least a nice reason. Like, why would, why would these women just come out here? Sure. They were just summoned. She says the queen is dead. Long live Alexa Bliss. This was almost like she, she, she started this off by saying how uh, people, women in the past would claim to be the queen in this division. So it was almost a direct uh, uh, you know, line at Charlotte. 
Yes, which kind of works now because Charlotte is uh, seemingly turning babyface. And she is now the goddess of the WWE. We've upgraded from a queen to a goddess overseeing yeah. Raw. And she knows she's the first woman to hold the Raw and SmackDown women's titles and deserved the coronation. And she starts going up to the women. She goes up to Mickey and notes her contemporaries, Mae Young and the fabulous Moolah, are in a better place. She probably just heard my interview with Pat LaProd and had Moolah and Mae Young on her mind. Oh. I'm sure. She was probably going to talk about Mildred Burke and Next, yeah. Clara Mortensen. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she introduces herself to Sasha, bringing up the fact that I'm the one who pinned you to get this shot. Goes up to Nia and just says, yeah, you and I are good. And ignored the other three who were just there. Alicia, Emma, Dana are not really of a concern. Not worthy of being addressed. So she stands on the podium and then all of a sudden notices Bailey. And it leads to this chant for Bailey. And she mentions that Bailey's family were in the front row on Sunday night in San Jose and saw her nephews crying after she lost the title. But now her family has a real role model. And this was enough. Bailey was going to take some action and knock Bliss off the podium. So much so that this microphone looked to have broken. Oh, I didn't catch it. Like, went into pieces here. They abruptly go to a commercial break. And then we come back. And it's an impromptu... Eight woman tag. I believe they announce Alexa mentioned in, during the segment itself that the, the match tag was, match was already announced. Yeah. Well, what they did was in the afternoon they did one of those WWE.com updates mm -hmm. where they announced a tag match with Alexa and Nia against Bailey and Sasha. Oh, okay. So within hours, they changed it to this. Mm -hmm. There was just no need for this. And this it's just amazing when you can see the little things like this mm -hmm. that really shines a light on the rapid pace of which they change m their direction. Yeah. We had, right up until the afternoon on the website, they were advertising Chris Jericho for his final Raw appearance tonight. And, I mean, we saw over the weekend all the shifting of, is Bailey going to win? Is Alexa going to win? Mm -hmm. So when I hear people complain about, well, it was playing out with the story for Alexa to win. I'm like, they... For 90% of the stuff, they are not mapping this out. It is as easy as a tag match. Let's do an eight-woman. And that's it. And they changed their mind on a dime. Yeah. In either case, did it make any difference whether or not this was an eight-woman or a tag team match? No, but there was a reason they had come up first with this tag direction mm -hmm. and then completely just changed it. Like, this went up at, like, three in the afternoon, right. and they changed their mind to this. Like, this was a big shift like we're gonna have yeah. all the women to start the show and we're gonna do this big promo perhaps, and get all the women in perhaps they saw the segment and they realized well what sense would it make for these other women to just leave you know why not just put them in the match well we got the eight woman tag with alexa naya emma and alicia against bailey sasha mickey and dana brooke and the announcers explained that bailey had a lot of pressure on her last night she has nothing to be ashamed of and Sasha gets sent to the floor. All the women have a standoff as they go through a break. Nia just runs through Sasha during the break. The crowd is cheering her on as Nia gets the heat. Bliss is in with Sasha, misses with a double knee drop, and Bailey is tagged, attacking Bliss. And Booker notes that she's getting a little payback after payback. There was a neck breaker in the ropes. She went for this Bailey to belly, but it was more of a back suplex, which the announcers noted. Nia made the save. James dove to the floor onto Nia. Everyone's fighting. Sasha and Fox go to the floor in this wild brawl where I thought someone was going to die. And then Bliss raked the eyes of Bailey right in front of the referee and hit her with a DDT and for the second straight night, pinned Bailey. Yeah. I have a feeling most in the audience didn't catch the eye rake. It was kind of really fast. And therefore, the, finish, uh, the reaction to the finish felt a little bit flat. Uh, so we're, we're kind of. This was dirtier than the title win, which was pretty much the same as this, minus an eye rake. Yeah, the total win really wasn't dirty at all. I mean, it was an injury caused by Bailey as herself. It was the pressure got to Bailey, which <laughs> I think is way worse for her. She just couldn't handle I mean, this. Well, nonetheless, you know, um, I, I think the booking makes sense to me. You know, it sets up a clear number one in the division now in Alexa Bliss, who I thought carried that opening segment really well. She, I thought her talking was very good. Yeah, she exudes the confidence to be able to lead a segment like that, and when you really look at the roster, she really is, I think, the best choice to play a top heel right now. She also had a lot of dialogue. Yeah. No, like, it wasn't even the back and forth that you usually mm -hmm. get of these opening promos. And yeah. This wasn't like the 15, 20-minute promo, mm -hmm. but it was 
good eight, nine minutes of just Alexa. She did a good job. I mean, she's certainly more there than Benaya right now. I'd say even she's more uh, capable than Sasha, who I think they have further plans for in the future uh, as a heel. So I have no problems with Alexa winning last night. And uh, who do you pair her with? Is well, she I think stay with Bailey? A rematch with Bailey is definitely. I think the they do the rematch, yeah. and somehow then you've got to get to Bailey and Sasha, and yep. maybe that's Bailey comes up short, and that's the turn. Mm -hmm. But uh, Bailey, you know, she's a character who I think is a better chaser than a champion, and this sets up a good opponent for her. Enzo and Big Cass came out with Enzo doing his intro, and said both of them are a little bit tired. Their real lives are better than their dreams. And they gave Anderson and Gallows the beating of their real lives. I don't know what this meant. He was kind of rambling here. Enzo. The bags under his eyes are Gucci. Okay. I don't know. No, you don't like that one? <laughs> oh. You can't relate to that line? I don't know. How I many feel... Gucci bags do you own? None under my eyes. Mm. I can tell you that. Cass starts to speak, and both get jumped from behind by Anderson and Gallows, and then one of the most frightening statements I've heard in quite some time. Enzo is scheduled to take on Luke Gallows. Mm. For six minutes, they were going to have a singles match. Mm -hmm. This was a daunting, daunting task. I would say it was barely a match. It was more like Luke Gallows tossing around a, you know, a punching bag. Did you notice the thing stuck in the back of Enzo's pants? Like like that do rag or something? No, it was it almost looked like this thin padding or something under his lower uh, on his lower back from I, his pants. I didn't notice. Go back and look at this. I almost thought, is this guy like t padding his lower back for when he falls? Is he working with an injury? I, I don't know what this was. I wouldn't blame it wasn't like tape. It wasn't athletic tape. It was like an actual like, if I didn't know any better, I would have thought it was, like, his notes or something in his back. But it, was, it looked like this thin padding. <laughs> his notes. Well, he needed some for this promo. Mm -hmm. He would, should have taken them out in red. Gallows uh, drops him with a boot as Booker calls Enzo the Flava Flav of public enemy. Of uh, Enzo and Cass. He's the Flava Flav. Yeah, sure. So he not? called him a, a public enemy. He screwed up his own comparison point. Right. But, sure. Okay. It's all Gallows beating him down. Mm. Enzo came back with these wild punches that maybe he could take his notes out and watch a Shane match and improve upon. These were just <laughs> awful looking. He's got a move now where he pretends he's a pitcher and winds up before yes. throwing his right hand. Like uh, No Way Jose and Kushida. Oh, they both got that. Yeah. He's also got one where he pretends he's kicking a field goal. He's, yeah, which, I'm sorry, uh, I find Enzo an entertaining guy. There's no way I'm taking a soccer kick from this guy and just chancing it. Mm. Yeah, he <laughs> did a soccer kick to the face of Gallows here, who is the bravest man on this roster. And Enzo's, like, move set now is just, like, this drop-down menu of other guys' finishes. Like, we've got eat. a soccer kick, eat defeat. Yeah. <laughs> He's just doing all these other moves. Um you know, Enzo held up better than other matches he's had in this, but it was largely just him getting thrown around. He got distracted from Anderson, so Gallows lifted him on his shoulders, threw him off, and pinned him in 546. Mm -hmm. That was that. Pretty basic uh, Enzo getting beaten up type of match. I, I found it a little hard to get into the match because I don't exactly know what will be gained by either team from winning this feud, you know? I'd say both teams are pretty much at the same level. Didn't they feud already? Like, a year ago, when they were doing, like, the doctor thing, the testicle thing. That, that was, was the new day. That was the new day. But, like, didn't they also feud with Enzo and Cass at the same time? They've gotten involved, yes. Whatever. But, you know, there's no championship involved. There's no real grudge involved. So, I'm not really sure why I should give a shit. I feel that we can say the same thing over and over, that, that Cass, is be he benefits from being paired with Enzo. Mm -hmm. But I'm almost at a point where I do want to see Cass kind of move on. Because this team is just... It's just in the same place it's always going to be. And I feel they do have high hopes for Cass. And this team is just, it's not advancing him any further yeah. to me. I mean, I think it could, and I think it largely comes down to creative, you know. Um, I think they need to win, yeah, and they need to win convincingly. And in order to actually have a run with the tag team belts, uh, before you finally break them off. And they haven't had that yet. Your favorite, TJ Perkins with a talking segment. 
goes up to Neville to ask, what happened to payback? I thought Ares wasn't at the Neville level. And he explains that people think that Neville had to resort to grabbing the referee's shirt for the disqualification. So Neville tells Perkins to tread lightly and that the referee was the unprofessional one for being out of position. And he calls Ares our problem. And he asks how Perkins is going to get back into the title contendership when you've got pretenders like Ares standing in the way. That is a very good question. And Neville has set up a match between Aries and Perkins for later tonight. I'm disappointed there weren't more um, quotables from Perkins in this one. He's been kind of toned down as of late. Do you think he just he hit a wall a few weeks ago? There was no, that was the that was one. Old Contra too much. Was the was definitely the high point. That was the pinnacle. Um, yeah. So <laughs> we got a SmackDown promo. Chris Jericho versus Kevin Owens for the title on Tuesday night. Will this be Jericho's last appearance? I think so. Mm-hmm. I think that's it. I think we did a title change for just the sake of surprising people. Mm-hmm. Seth Rollins comes out, and apparently TJ <laughs> decided, you know what, Seth? <laughs> you got this. <laughs> Here's my script for tonight. Dude, I transcribed <laughs> the beginning of this. I did too. <laughs> Sacramento, how you feeling tonight? You doing well? Man, you doing well? Let me hear you. That's good. That's good, man. I'm feeling well, too. <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, you doing well? Let me hear you. That's good. That's good, man. Uh, he, he, just, he speaks as if he's like a number one fan favorite. He sounded and like he just shot up meth in the back and came out wow. and is rambling. Yeah. Uh, meth Rollins. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I meth didn't Rollins. even. I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, you know, he's, he's kind of, like, scripted to speak as if, like, wow, you guys are really on my side, and we did it. We did it together. But he really doesn't have the crowd as much as I think they're scripting him to be. He's hardly a Daniel Bryan type at this moment. Maybe at one time he could have been. But right now, it just I'd say he's more like a number six fan favorite than a number one. There's more. He says life has been a roller coaster of late. We've all been there. From the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. This was right out of many conversations I've had with Way sometimes when he's down. Sometimes you just want to give up, but you can't do that, Way. You've got to embrace the sucky part of life. And that's what I did, Way. I looked in the mirror and realized that I'm still John freaking Pollock. I slayed the King of Kings at WrestleMania. Then I got payback on Samoa Joe. And now I want the Beast and the Universal title. Man, just this is how wrestlers talk. No, it's not how wrestlers are supposed to talk. No, it's not. This is how robots come out and communicate words that were dictated to them by somebody that's never spoken in public before, but writes them down on pieces of paper. Finn Balor interrupted him and said they have been in the same spot where Rollins was the one legged man that won at WrestleMania, while Balor was the one armed man that won the Universal title at SummerSlam that his arm was hanging, yet he still beat Rollins and never lost that title, so he's the one that deserves the match with Brock Lesnar. The crowd, from, from this interaction at least, you can definitely feel like the crowd would rather see Rollins get that shot than Balor. Yeah, I guess so. This seemed like a, a crowd that was into Rollins, especially throughout the show. Um, I didn't really notice one significantly over the other here, but... I think we can safely assume that number three of the three would be Dean Ambrose, who came out and said, Brock, 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 Brock. (laughs) (laughs) Ambrose was the star of this. Ambrose Ambrose had like... You know what Monday was? Monday night was the definitive, I don't give a fuck, Dean Ambrose. Yeah, I mean... He said, you all sound like a bunch of chickens. Brock, 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 Brock. (laughs) <laughs> oh. He knows a lot about Lesnar, but he feels Raw should be about fighting champions, and they should be talking about the IC title because it's the number one title on Raw. Now that this is part of the storyline, this champion that's just fucked off and disappeared, like, what the hell? 
There's no explanation mm. for this. It's like it's part of the angle now that our champions just disappeared with the title. There's no reason. There's no excuse. There's no suspension. There's no injury. There's no movie he's off doing. There's no request of a vacation that Brock uh, submitted at the Royal Rumble for this time. Nothing. Right. He's just disappeared. Like, doesn't the, the viewer ask, where the fuck is this guy? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, su- I suppose. Like, anything. Just give me any reason. Tell me that he's waiting for George St. Pierre to be able to fight. I suppose. Yes, you're right. Um, but I, I don't know if the average fan is necessarily uh, asking those questions. It's almost just accepted. Well, now it's being brought up, though. Right. And the average fan, I would say, accepts that Brock Lesnar... That, that we don't have a champion? Yeah. <laughs> Except well. that Brock Lesnar only makes intermittent appearances because he is a special attraction. And when he does appear, they will react as, as big as they've always reacted. I can get that that thinking of that presentation of Brock, but you've got to meet people somewhat. Like, this is your world champion. Mm-hmm. And it's now part of it that our champion doesn't show up. Right. You have challengers that want to face this guy. Mm-hmm. Like, you have to make... You've got to give something. You've got to do yeah. anything. Um, I agree. Even if it's just like weekly updates, you know, what is Brock Lesnar up to? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I think it's a definite issue. And it will be more pronounced if he doesn't make an appearance at the next pay-per-view. Like even to say Brock is coming back July 9th and it's a free-for-all. Who is going to get this title shot? Like mm-hmm. at least give anything. I found this particular um, instance a little sad, though. It was almost like these two, Finn Balor and Seth Rollins, are both like, I want that world title. Meanwhile, Dean Ambrose comes out and he says, hey, hey, guys, remember this? Like, <laughs> anybody want this thing? <laughs> like, he was begging for a challenger for his own title. None of these guys want, want the, this IC belt. Are you guys chicken? <laughs> the Miz is out with Maurice and calls Ambrose an embarrassment as champion. He deserves the IC title. Calls Balor a coward for cheap shotting him at the payback, payback kickoff. He says he defended the title nightly while Ambrose was not even important enough to have a match at payback. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of true. Which he didn't have a counter for. Mm-hmm. Calls Rollins a gimp. And then he goes to say that he's the biggest threat on Raw. And right as he goes to say this, Ambrose, Balor, and Rollins collectively say, shut up together in our sitcom moment. I was waiting for the laugh track. Oh, God. You know, that's... This stuff, like, might be fine on paper. I'm sure it's good. It wasn't in execution, (laughs) way. It was awful in execution, because this is not a a sitcom. You know, and these aren't actors. Like, imagine... (laughs) Brock, 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 Brock. You all sound like chickens. Collectively, in unison, shut up, Miz. <laughs> God damn. Uh, it didn't turn out that bad, okay? Like, I mean, us talking about it now, it's hilarious. But live, it, 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 they it, didn't it, really it, re- it did what it was achieved, uh, supposed to do. He stopped talking. They, he, they had him obey the command. Uh, Ambrose asks, who wants the Miz to get beaten up? So he calls Kurt on his cell phone. And Kurt answered the phone, theoretically, and set up a three-way number one contenders match for the IC title. Yeah. The number one title mm-hmm. for later tonight. Uh, so that's it. So with Miz, Balor, and Rollins for later. Um, I mean, you know, it, 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 the whole segment was fine. It set up uh, the main event. I think, for me, it really pointed out Finn Balor's lack of experience on the microphone. I thought this segment did that, and I thought the segment from the kickoff at Payback kind of did that. You're not um, a fan of the I just got my ass kicked by Balor club? The Finn, ba- Balor the Finn just Bal- kicked my ass club? Yeah. No, no, I'm not a fan of it. Um, you know, it, it's he's somebody who I think is a, a victim of poor writing, and uh, he himself has a weaker, more rehearsed level of delivery than the others, the other three here at least. So I think he needs to be protected. He also needs to get his reps in, but... Uh, I think segments like these kind of expose it. Maybe Nas could right. give him some lessons on cutting promos. Why? That's his guy, Nas. Oh, okay. Is yeah, it? I guess. I mean, I, I guess Nas kind of cuts promos. Draw, draw your inspiration somewhere. Yeah. Maybe you can just drop, like, tracks or something, like have produced videos. Yeah. 
They recap the Strowman and Reigns uh, attack from Payback uh, after the match. Then it was a six-man tag with Tony Nese, Brian Kendrick, and Noam Dar against Rich Swan, Akira Tozawa, and Jack Gallagher. Gallagher brought umbrellas out for Swan and Tozawa. As Michael Cole said, folks, this is what 205 Live is all about. <laughs> Which was very appropriate. Mm. Gallagher used these leg scissors to send Dar to the floor, and then Tozawa boots Kendrick. They did this triple team back, bo- back body drop, sending Nice to the floor for the commercial break. The miraculous heel recovery during the break. Tozawa gets dumped on the floor after a delayed vertical on the top rope. Swanson tagged in. Kendrick tried for the sliced bread. Gallagher tags himself in, headbutts Nice, sends Nice to the floor. Kendrick applies the captain's hook to Gallagher with Tozawa breaking it with a shining wizard. Swan and Tozawa hit stereo dives, and then Gallagher with the gentleman's drop kick, which is the running drop kick, hit Kendrick in the corner and pinned him. And then Michael Cole asked Booker T what he and Stevie Ray might have been like if they had umbrellas, or what G.I. Bro would have been like with an umbrella. Ah, oh, nice. So nice really uh, bookended this match with umbrella chat was bookended. Michael Cole. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know these kind of like undercard cruiserweight matches. They, they, the the big flashy moves get good reactions, and they're actually good matches. But the reactions noticeably settle once the moves are, uh, you know, kind of over. And I think that's because the crowd likes the big flashy moves. But beyond that, there's no real reason to care about the outcome of the matches. So the near falls don't really connect. You don't really have a, a stake in the match. You don't really care who wins because there's no nothing gets furthered by the result of the match. So I feel like now more than ever, they need to experiment with some type of gimmick, like... like uh, Umbrellas. Like, uh, no, not just that, but uh, t- a tournament, you know? Just just to add some stakes to these kind of relatively pointless matches. Cesaro and Sheamus came out in these jackets with their kilts. Their names are on the front. Sheamus says they are finally set free. Sheamus never liked any of the people. He's always been treated like a red-headed stepchild. Ha ha. Cesaro had his Cesaro section, and he thought the fans were behind them until WrestleMania. They were all ready to win the tag titles, and then the Hardys were added to the match and stole their moment. The crowd was chanting, delete. Seamus notes, that's cute. And Cesaro says that all the fans felt a rush of nostalgia, just like they do every time a shiny new trinket shows up. The fans would rather look to the past or the future rather than appreciate the present that is in front of them. And the Hardys are just a novelty act, with Seamus adding, that's the tooth of it. I mean, truth of it. And they end by, I guess the new thing is you, you say things together. We don't just set the bar. We are the bar. Um, I thought a good promo. I think that you at least had justification yeah. for this turn and... Cesaro, I mean, the best promos are ones where you can draw from from real frustrations, which I'm sure is the case, that here we are, the guys that are here every week, and fans are talking about guys from the past, and, and the Hardys come in, and they get a big reaction, and it's, to me, it was a logical turn. It made, it made sense, rather than, well, we need to turn these guys for no reason. No problems at all with the logic of the turn. I thought Sheamus... By far, sounds like a more natural heel, and it is na- naturally a better heel than he is a baby face. Um, Cesaro, on the other hand, I think is a much tougher heel promo. I think it feels like it's a real struggle for him. I think it goes against what the fans want to do for him, and that's cheer him. Uh, his his style is also super baby face. Right. I have no doubt he'll be able to adapt and have great matches even as a heel, but his promo, I think, will be a lot tougher to execute in a heelish voice. The Hardys come out, and Matt says their response is, as he drops the mic, and they both do the delete sign, him and Jeff charging at the ring, but Sheamus and Cesaro bail. And thankfully, the Hardys got the night off after their Brawl for All match. Do you know any update on whether or not they've uh, acquired the rights to the gimmick? No, I, I haven't heard that they've acquired them, no. Right. Okay. So they've at this point the the update at least on TV is that they they've adopted the delete chant, but it's just another Hardy Boys chant, much like you know this is or or whatever. It's got nothing to do with the broken persona. After Sunday night, do you want to see them go full fledged with the broken characters? Yes, I do. Why not? Why wouldn't I? Uh, because what I saw on Sunday night with the House of Horrors, I I 
I really don't want to see this go further. No, there's no guarantee that one would be the same as the other. Oh, I, I, I feel that we would get into that territory at some point. I think it just makes Matt more interesting. You know, right now they're definitely riding on nostalgia, and I think uh, once they're done with it, um, the broken characters are something they actually need to keep going, I feel. I feel it's great for Matt. I don't think Jeff necessarily... No. yeah, not for Jeff. I, th- I think ultimately he's going to get the singles run yeah. out of this, and Matt is going to be an undercard babyface with that character. Depends how far they want to go with the character and how much money they're going to pay for it. You know, if they're well invested into it, I could see Matt going pretty far. Charlie is with Miz and Maurice backstage and mentions the history of Rollins injuring Balor. He turns his head, talking off the mic, and then turns back, and there is Ambrose holding the microphone, asking Miz about his hair gel, and then throws it back to Gene and Bobby at ringside. He's mean Dean Ambrose. Yes. The title of this show. Oh, is that right? Okay. Slater and Rhino are in the back with Apollo Crews. This was earlier in the night. This was to set up a big... This was an angle built on YouTube. Yeah, this was planned earlier in the day. I mean, like, I, I, are there, is there a way you can rank, I guess, the importance of an angle, you know? I mean, obviously, on Raw is kind of like the... Yeah, I'd say, yeah, on Raw is, is the top, and then maybe you have uh, maybe a network exclusive, and then you got Facebook, and then I'd say YouTube below that. Is YouTube below Facebook? YouTube below Facebook, and then you have Tout, which doesn't even exist. But yeah. they have shot angles on Tout. Oh, yeah. They, so, they once explained Brock Lesnar's absence on Tout. Yeah. So at least this was better than that. Yeah. So what happened was they were giving Apollo Crews advice on his soon-to-be daughter, who is advice on, on the way. Yeah. Fatherhood. Yeah. Titus walks in and tells him, you should come to me for advice and not speak to the enemy, which, in Titus's defense... Father of the year. I mean, Christ, Apollo. Yeah. Like, if you're going to ask anybody for advice, it'd be the father of the year. Yeah, it wouldn't be these two nimwits. Hmm. Heath took on Apollo Crews. Rhino and Titus were in the respective corners. We got a He's Got Kids chant. Slater sent Crews to the floor. Something was going on the crowd, in the crowd throughout this, and they started booing something. And they didn't give a shit about this match. That was the other thing. No, not at no. all. Uh, Cruz hit an Inziguri in the spinning sit-out powerbomb for th- a three-and-a-half-minute win. This and then a... Titus took a selfie. <laughs> Which uh, Rhino photobombed while his partner was lying there defeated. You know, what a jerk. Um, this is a prelim storyline designed to develop Apollo Cruz, And unfortunately, Great job. like most Titus O'Neil storylines, it seems a little directionless and doesn't seem all that promising, you know? Uh, I think... Maybe he'll become a spacecraft. <laughs> Apollo? <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? Um, I think, unfortunately, it kind of relegates Titus, or sorry, Apollo to the comedy undercard. Uh, which, this poor guy. Like, yeah. he just. This was a chance to redebut him at a higher level. And I think he's perfectly capable of being in, a, in the, a solid mid card state with guys like, you know, uh, eh. Maybe not quite at the Miz, but like, why not? Even if you had Miz versus Apollo, I would, I would buy it. I feel uh, that there's, there's a pattern of a lot of these characters that it's just that. It's we've got to get these characters on these guys, and they deviate away from personalities. And with Apollo, with Finn Balor, with Roderick Strong last week on NXT, I mean, these guys have all benefited from just video packages about who these people are. What are their motivations? And to me, I will take personality and stories over these wacky characters any day. And there's a long history uh, of what works and what doesn't work in terms of money characters. To them, though, these storylines are how they get personalities over. You know what I mean? I I I think it's a way that you give some identifiable traits, but this, this process gives you another Heath Slater and Rhino. I agree. Where those are useless people on this roster. All think, due respect. I think in hindsight, Apollo really should have spent the last year back in NXT where I think he could have main evented a few takeovers and gained a bit more character development in the process. Maybe even as a result, if he did that, he could have debuted on the on the main roster at a higher level than he currently is right now. Yeah, he's just, I, I think he's a very talented performer. Yeah. And they've just, they have no idea what to do with him. And, None. And, and it's like, been a year. And the weeks, the, the, the more the guy is exposed in the undercard, the harder it is. You're going, branded as that. That becomes very tough to overcome. Like mm-hmm. Drew McIntyre, 
had to leave and reinvent himself yeah. and co- and has come back. But a lot of guys, they're just they're there for so long, and then it becomes very difficult to see them in a different light. I'll say like they at least introduced. I think the the only real thing we know about Apollo Cruz up until this point is that he's a soon to be father. You know, and maybe they'll kind of build on that, but that seems to be the most, at least some nugget of relatability that they have with him. 205 Live promo. We're going to get TJ Perkins against Lindsay Dorado, Rich Swan against Noam Dar, and Drew Gulak versus Mustafa Ali. Oh. The big match. match. What are the odds? How many of those matches happen on 205 Live? You You think all all three? You think they'll get canceled? You think one? I could I could see something matches? switching, a hundred percent. Okay, it's happened before. You uh, think all three will happen? Yeah, sure. Okay, we'll see. Kurt Angle comes out at the start of the third hour. Booker calls him the no nonsense GM. Clearly, Booker fell asleep during the Hall of Fame. What do you mean? The no nonsense general manager, Kurt Angle. What's the hall? What's the hall of fame? I mean, this guy is is the goofball. I mean, Kurt Angle. Oh, I mean, right. Yeah, I wouldn't call him the the no nonsense well, as a, GM. As a GM, he's been no nonsense. Angle, well, just brace yourself for the next ten minutes. <laughs> Angle says that Reigns and Strowman had the most physical match he has ever seen. Hasn't watched uh, Shibata Okada, obviously. He probably hasn't watched his own matches. I mean, this guy is <laughs> like my God. <laughs> Uh, he says Reigns has re-injured his ribs and Strowman tore his rotator cuff. They are not done with each other, and he has spoken to officials about what to do, which is kind of Kurt's job, isn't it? To yeah. figure out what to do with these guys he generally manages. Bray Wyatt interrupts. It's darkness in the arena as the light shines down. Do you notice that like Kurt has trouble saying... The letters WWE. I did note that. He keeps saying WWE. WWE. Double double E. Fuck, I can't believe you noticed that <laughs> yeah. too. I totally noted that. I mean, if, you, if you're going to be the GM of one of their brands, I think you can at least make a real effort to try to say those Listen, letters. Listen, it, it does take some effort to properly pronounce WWE, <laughs> and it? I probably do it as well, WWE. But Kurtz is ridiculous. Like, it's WWE. Yes. Double, Listen double, to this, double, and you'll. Double e. I heard he said it like three <laughs> times in the span of ten seconds. You he, will never not hear it from now on. He didn't always have this issue. I never noticed right. it till tonight, but you and I both noted it tonight. Dub dub e. I like. I think he'll he'll probably work on it. Dub dub e. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, break. He also lost fifteen pounds sweating under these lights. He was glistening. Like, he looked like a turkey you had just brought out of the oven for Thanksgiving dinner. Bray says that first he introduces himself to Kurt, and they awkwardly shake hands. Bray has come here as a savior. Randy Orton will forever be trapped in his house of horrors. So even Bray tuned out of the second half of their match. (laughs) He states that he is reborn. This is his latest rebirth. And he has a cure to the poison in his mind and his voice. And Angle needs him because Angle is suffering from this poison. However, it's too numb for Kurt to feel it. Uh, again, I only laugh because of you having to recap that. <laughs> Kurt uh, asks if so Bray will be allowed to do his work or stand in his way. Angle says this is his show, but Bray says... This is my world. And it cut to black. You have a real uh, gift of like to recap these things and making them sound way more hilarious than the first time I watched them. I thought you were going to say logical because I did not make this sound any more logical oh than God. he presented it. Oh, you're so funny. You should do stand-up where you just recap professional wrestling storylines. Oh. I think you would kill. If I feel these last 48 hours... I'm I'm selling my stock on Bray Wyatt. Really? I'm just done with this guy. I didn't have a problem with this. Oh, I did. I well, mean, what did he say? To me, this was just uh, some provided some closure to the whole Randy Orton thing, and it was almost like uh, his introduction to the Raw audience, you know, the Raw brand. And, you know, his, just his mission statement saying, hey, this is now my, my world, 
and I'm taking over the show. And I thought it was perfectly fine. I'm just, I now have, I used to be open-minded about where Bray is going. I now feel these programs are a detriment to my enjoyment of the show. I've just had too many of these Wyatt programs that I just get frustrated with, that I don't understand, that I'm not invested in. I feel his promos are just, they've never found the, the words have never found the audience. Right. By and large, I think there, there is a problem with a lot of his promos connecting, but I think every so often you have something that, that does hit and, you know, there were moments of the Randy program that I thought were very good, you know, like for the a good first chunk of it. when, when Months or- ago. Yeah, Orton was doing really well. Then so, there was the giant sperm. <laughs> I think it went south a little bit before that. But that, it, that's not to say that this Bray Wyatt character is not um, a great tool in their universe. Oh, God, I can't believe I just said that. Universe, but you know, he's poison, and I want to be <laughs> numb so I can't feel it any longer. No, like he, 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 he needs to be taken tr- treated with care. You probably would have said the same thing about the Undertaker if he was on every single week, cutting a promo every single week. Maybe a character like Bray's is best, you know, d- making sporadic appearances, or at least you know, cutting promos sporadically. But are you excited about Bray Dean, the revisiting? Bray and Dean, no, that's the feud. It's Bray and Balor. It's Bray and... He knocked Balor off the top rope. Oh, that's right. He was back to Balor tonight. Yeah. After last week, it was the Dean attack. You're yeah. right. You're right. I'm very... I'm really looking forward Sorry, to Sorry, and they flipped them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm really looking forward to Bray and Balor. I think for... I mean, we'll talk more about it later, but I, 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 I'm really excited the about The Battle of Bray. Ah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, the segment ended. Ambrose shows up in Rollins' locker room with the microphone to interview him. Rollins is very confused by this. Dean asks, why? There's cameras here. Yeah. Rollins is like, okay. Breaking that fourth wall. Yeah, and then they spoke in the third person back and forth, and then Dean threw it back to Gorilla, and Graves thanked Sean Mooney. I I really hate comedian Dean Ambrose, man. Uh, He's just like, he's like... (laughs) Are you going to use the air quotes for comedian? (laughs) Mm. He's like the guy who, like, his family and friends tell him, hey, you're so funny. You're so funny. You should be a comedian. <laughs> so the guy goes to open mic night, and he just bombs. And that's what this was. This was a giant bomb throughout the entire show. I mean, so I found this guy really irritating, but maybe Renee really liked it. I can't possibly fathom that. I can. I would love to know. Listen, I, I have heard stories of, like, Dean openly complaining about material and stuff. So I, I wonder where his mindset is when it comes to you come to the show and there was a lot of crap throwing Dean's way here. It's possible, but I, I feel like when he performs in this, there just seems to be so much of him in, like, it, it doesn't feel like he's acting, you know? It feels like he's improvising in a lot of cases. So I feel like a lot of this is probably coming from him. It's my hunch, at least. Well, I do feel that it's him trying to inject some of his personality into this it's not working but it's just at what point are you fighting these battles where this i mean this guy is among the highest of where of who gets the worst material like dean is right near the top it's not working for us i but anytime like something like comedy doesn't work for me i question how like a child might like it because I don't find, like, c- clowns at kids' parties entertaining at all, but kids seem to love Depends them. on the clown. And that's what Dean Ambrose might be, you know. He's the, a clown. The kids, yeah. Austin Aries took on TJ Perkins. Uh, Booker notes that Aries thanked him after payback because on commentary he referred to Aries as kid. Aries just turned 39. <laughs> Aries hit a missile drop kick off the top, and then Perkins places Aries in the tree of woe and hits a running drop kick to the left knee and throughout the rest of the match worked that knee. Booker also congratulated Cole on it being six years since he won a country whipping match where he pinned Jim Ross. Oh, right. This was a real non sequitur in this yeah. match. Hmm. It just came out of nowhere. Um, I really like this match. Um, Perkins, um, I thought this was better than the title match the night before with Neville and Aries. Um, It was just Perkins working on the knee. Aries then finally um, sends Perkins into the post and hops on the one knee, hitting a tope to the floor. Neville is shown watching in the back. Aries makes his comeback, hits an elbow to the back of the head. 
Sets up for the discus five arm, but Perkins kicks out the knee, and then Perkins lifts him up for the detonation kick, but Aries counters in midair into the last chancery, which is a really nice counter and transition spot, and Perkins tapped. And then afterwards, Aries is putting his arm in the air, and he gets hit in the knee from behind, and Perkins applied the knee bar, and both guys had marks all over their bodies. Like, they had just been through a strap match. Dude, these chops were, Holy like, m- really hard, and... I thought it was a good match. I, I enjoyed it. I really liked the match. I enjoyed the match from last night, too. But um, I thought this one was also very good. Designed to, to somewhat rehab Aries after uh, his failure last night. Also, to build up Perkins, who uh, I see kind of just being... Keeping Aries occupied until the next uh, rematch against against Neville. Um, I don't think these losses of late have, have hurt Perkins. I, I think he's... I, I like him better in this role. He's having very good matches. The more he's losing, the more he's able to give uh, have a reason to show his mean streak. And the the meaner he can become, the I think you know the more successful his new heel character will be. Uh, I love Aries' like new thunderclap move, which is just so simple, perfectly safe, and it makes this loud smack that maybe more of that and less of the chops. Yeah. Smacking seems to do really well. Probably gets a know? bigger reaction per capita. Definitely. Uh, so Aries Neville really is the only program the crowd seems to care about in the cruiserweight division. So I think uh, the only move is to keep it going. And maybe along the way you can introduce some side characters to get them over, like a TJ Perkins. Well, I didn't like the DQ finish. I would have been fine with a DQ finish in a more creative way. But we do have extreme rules coming up, and it feels that it's going to be all gimmick matches. And a lot of the screwy finishes at Payback, the silver lining is it can build up to stipulation matches where, I mean, Neville and Aries, it might be as simple as a no DQ match. And Neville goes on this run where he's challenged by these guys, and he just gets out with DQs over the next few weeks, something like that. But it feels that the title change has to happen, and maybe that's where they, they hold it off until... Finn is walking in the back, and Ambrose runs up. Please welcome my guest at this time. He asks if he's nervous, and Finn says, I eat nerves. (laughs) He also eats. He also doesn't eat carbs, unless prompted by Ambrose, (laughs) who hands him a donut, telling him to eat a carb because he has veins in his abs, and Finn takes a bite of this donut. I hate, I, you know how many times I laughed? <laughs> I'm putting up a donut. <laughs> oh, man. I, I thought this just made Finn Balor far less cool, you know? Like, up until this point, I think Balor hasn't really had a whole lot uh, other than, you know, great entrance, great wrestling, eh, promo, but the guy looks really cool. You know, cool leather jacket, cool face paint, cool haircut, cool beard, everything. This this wasn't quite Goldberg wig level, but it was certainly within the same realm, and it did nobody any favors. And then the drifter drifted by. Ambrose was into his music. Asked if he knew any Pearl Jam. (laughs) What? Why are you laughing? <laughs> <Wasn't>, I'm <laughs> now trying you, to laugh yeah, at something here. Funny. I think you really have to have a, a stand-up comedy career in you. If you. This isn't my work. <laughs> this isn't my material. I'm just recapping this way. This was the actual thing. He asked if he knew any Pearl Jam. <laughs> That's how it ended. Gold Dust is showing in the general manager's office, pitching a big blockbuster, bigger than Baywatch or Guardians of the Galaxy. He calls it the Golden Quest, and it's him and R-Truth pitching Kurt Angle on them getting a tag title shot against the Hardys. Yeah. It's be a comedy. Look out, box office records. Yeah. Kurt cannot sanction the match because their win-loss <laughs> record is awful. <laughs> <laughs> Dustin yeah. says, or Gold Dust says, Kurt, we've known each other for 20 years, at least. No. You haven't known each other 20 years, at least. You haven't even known each other 20 years. They have? Kurt signed with the company in 98. Yeah, they might have known each other. How would they have known each other? It was just, I don't know, from word of mouth. Yeah, Dustin was, was uh, maybe he was in Atlanta for the games. Sure. Well, 20 years at least. <laughs> they just want to prove they can be great again. They both really need this. So Angle says next week we're going to have a tag turmoil match. 
and the winners will be the number one contenders. And they say, okay. Yeah, it's interesting uh, to think about what they'll do because clearly it looks like Cesaro and Sheamus are the next ones to get the title shot. So perhaps to come out of this tag team turmoil thing, I expect Golden Truth to fail, and maybe that'll set up some type of breakup or heel turn for one of them. Oh, man. That'll be a, that could be SummerSlam. Big blockbuster. <laughs> Finn, Miz, and Seth Rollins. Number one contenders match for the number one title on Raw. Miz bailed to the floor early as Rollins and Balor started, and eventually they chase after Miz, get him inside the ring. Miz yanked Balor off the apron. He crashed to the floor, and Rollins and drop kicked Miz off the apron. Rollins goes for a dive, but Miz uses Maurice as a shield, and then Balor gets in the face of Maurice, allowing Rollins to hit a Pescato. Rollins and Balor just kept stopping the other. Miz then shoves Rollins off the top to go to the break. Miz is hitting the Daniel Bryan kicks, and then Booker says that nothing is sacred in this business as he's throwing these kicks. Did Mi- you? Did you? Sorry, before you continue, did you see the moment when Seth Rollins hit that um, uh, springboard crossbody and landed on his head, or almost did? No, it was a very scary moment. They actually replayed it, but he was uh, hitting a springboard crossbody onto Balor. And, like, something... This was into the ring. Bal- yeah, Balor was out of position or something, and it looked like Seth just, like, almost hit his head on it. But I think, thankfully, he rolled. But could you imagine if, like, either one of those two got injured again? Yes. Yeah, it would It would raise some serious concern for, I guess, their style. Well, um, hopefully they were all okay after this. Um Miz missed Balor with one kick and then got shoved into a DDT from Rollins. And the match really picked up at at this point. They were going into uh, different near falls. Rollins uh, got hit with the 1916, which is the reverse bloody Sunday. Miz made the save. Miz then pulled Balor into the post, crotching him. Drop kicks Rollins' bad knee. Uh, Crowd was really into this. Cole was putting over all three as the future. Rollins hit a double blockbuster to both, and then a frog frog splash to Balor for a near fall, and they cut away to this fan who must have peed. Rollins then hit a superplex, then a falcon arrow, but Miz kicked out, hit a suicide dive to Balor, then one to Miz on the opposite side. He's on the floor. Samoa Joe pops out from the crowd and hit a urinagi to Seth on the floor. This got so much heat because Mm -hmm. they were loving this match, and Samoa Joe was out of... Out of your mind. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't even think about this guy Mm -hmm. on the show uh, until he showed up. Miz was stunned by this, turns around, gets hit with a sling blade by Balor, and Balor goes for the coup de grace when the lights go out and Bray knocks Balor off of the turnbuckle, hitting the sister Abigail, and then disappears. Miz crawls on top of Balor to win the match as the show ends. A really, really good main event. And Mm -hmm. um, set up all the programs, which... I was confused going over this because originally we had uh, Balor and Bray positioned together. Last week, it felt like they flipped, and based on payback especially, it looked like they were building to Miz and Finn. And then tonight, it was we changed it back again. So now Miz is going after Ambrose's title. Balor is with Bray, and Seth is with Joe. So Mm. you have all your programs in place for Extreme Rules, which yeah. I think will be headlined by Strowman and Reigns in another rematch. But I really enjoyed this uh, this main event. Really liked the main event. I thought everything was tremendous. I thought this was the first great match of the, the new season for Raw, if you want to call it that. Easily Miz's best Raw since the draft. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, I really liked his role in this as the, as the mean, coward, as the heel in he this. He did a great job. I thought he played his role tremendously on the mic and in the match. Uh, I thought Rollins and Balor really... Really, uh, you know, impressed in in the uh, in the match itself, and I thought both, as a result, came out of this looking like way stronger baby faces than they did uh, even in the earlier segment tonight. So uh, I love the breaking off of the 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 programs for the two of them. I think Bray versus Balor is an excellent program for both Finn 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 Balor and Bray Wyatt. I think it's an well, Bray needs a rehab badly. Well, I think it's an opportunity for them to really flesh out that demon character of Finn Balor's, who up until this point. I mean, really, it's just largely something that looks cool. They made sort of a half-assed attempt at it, at explaining it for the Seth Rollins SummerSlam match, but we still don't really know. We don't know much about the Finn Balor character. So I think this whole Bray Wyatt world is a good, you know, resource for them to, to really develop Finn. Well, 
consider me uh, at least somewhat trepidatious you of be. where they go you with be. this. Yeah. Certainly, it's you're right, but they go into that wacky stuff, and the results have not been great of late. So yeah. let us see where things progress here. There, there needs to be, I think, if there's any lesson to be taken. I mean, was there any... Was there any part of the Bray Wyatt thing, uh, storyline that you you enjoyed? You know, like the the kind of like the 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 netherworldly type of things that that you enjoyed, if you can remember. Like there were like I, in his history of the character. No, I meant like of the Randy program. I, I mean, listen, up until where where Randy was infiltrating them, and even the burning down of the house. Yeah, I was okay up until then. Uh-huh. We discussed this. Yeah. I didn't hate up until then. And but the crucifix, the crucifix was, was the turning, the turning point. point. Yes, <laughs> the there crucifix. was there was a crucifix in the road, <laughs> and it was all downhill from there. And it's my worst feud of the year, easily. Like nothing will. I hope nothing hits it. So hopefully, maybe if there's something to be learned from it, is that you know a bit of that kind of weirdness is good, but it needs to be somewhat grounded. Well, you need to have. Uh, you could go on and on about the problems. I will say this. The next time Randy has a Wizard World q and A, I I am booking time off work, and I'm getting on an airplane to go to that Q&A sure. to ask Randy about the House of Horrors. What did you think of Raw overall? Um, I thought it was a good show. Yeah. It's Raw has really been in the dumps for me personally of late. Um, this show wasn't a home run, but in the third hour, I love that main event, and I really liked Aries and Perkins. Yeah. And I thought Alexa did a very good job on the microphone. So I, I thought a pretty good raw. It, it, not a home run, but this was a solid double eyeing third. But not going for third. Like, let's not get crazy. Okay. It was a double. Got it. It was a double. Got it. Perfectly respectable show. Maybe like a maybe like a double with an error so the guy reaches third. Yeah. And, hey, credit, they kept Reigns and Strowman off the show, mm-hmm. too, which yep. Raw does not have the deepest roster for a three-hour show. And when you eliminate those two... Um, it does kind of stretch everyone thin on this show, and you had you had a great 22-minute match to yeah. compensate for that. And I like the fact that they kept those two off if they didn't have a great idea and sell the effects of the match. I feel like having a strong main event makes all the difference in the world about uh, of my enjoyment. It's how it goes off of the, the air, sure. Yeah, so uh, I think if if you can leave the show with, with any thought, it's that, at least in terms of in-ring, the roster is actually very strong. You have a... a Seth Rollins, Finn Balor, even a Dean Ambrose, even a, a Roman Reigns and, and Braun Strowman, you know, so and a, and a and a Bray Wyatt. So it maybe in terms of like overall star power, it's not to Attitude Era level certainly, but I would say in ring they're still very strong. Oh, in ring it's it's very strong, mm-hmm. especially when you have you do have the X factor and Jeff Hardy who could very well be transitioned into yes. that that mix at a certain point. So that'll wrap up Raw. We will be back Wednesday to chat about SmackDown and whether or not we'll have a new United States champion. I don't know. There's a whole merchandise line out for for the challenger, so it seems like we are going to get a title change. We'll have to find out. And those three big matches on 205 Live, we'll see if those all take place. That's going to wrap it up for us. Go to liveaudiowrestling.com, youtube.com slash liveaudiowrestling, where you can watch, review a SmackDown, and review a Raw every week. And, of course... The secret question. Mm-hmm. It showed up. Tweet us at Law Radio, and we will draw the winner on Thursday. That is it. For Wei Ting, I'm John Pollock, and thanks for watching Review a Raw. Each week, you have a chance to win a t-shirt from Pro Wrestling Tees during Review a Raw. All you have to do is pay attention for the secret question, and then submit your answer at Law Radio on Twitter, and you'll be entered into a draw to win your t-shirt, including our own brand of shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com slash law. Oh, 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 oh,